Thanks very much, and thank you to Chris and Cerebra for asking me to, to speak to you today. Um, as Richard said, I'm from the um, Cerebra Centre for Neurodevelopmental Disorders, working with Chris Oliver, part of the research team there. Um, and today I'm going to be talking um, about social difficulties and autism spectrum disorder in genetic syndromes. Um, and by genetic syndromes, I mean um, disorders which are associated with intellectual disability that have a specific um, and known genetic cause. Um, so first we're going to take a look at um, the, the prevalence rates that are available from the literature of uh, looking at ASD um, in genetic syndromes. Um, I'm going to focus a bit more on the profile and the presentation of these characteristics in this group. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on two particular syndromes, Cornelia de Lange syndrome and Angelman syndrome, um, just because these uh, two, two groups have, uh, give us quite, uh, quite good examples um, of highlighting some of the issues and important aspects to think about when um, trying to assess um, autism spectrum disorder characteristics within this population. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about what the implications are for assessing um, and what the value, the pragmatic value of understanding these characteristics within these particular groups um, is. Um, so what is autism spectrum disorder? Many of you um, will know, but for those of you who, who, who are not familiar with the term, um, autism spectrum disorder is recognised by impairments and difficulties in three specific areas, also known as the triad of impairments, so particularly in communication, um, social interaction and social relatedness and the presence of repetitive behaviours and restricted interests. And typically these impairments and behaviours are evident before the age of, of three years. Um, I should note that um, the, there are some changes um, coming early next year uh, in terms of the way that um, autism spectrum disorder is, is diagnosed and this three category um, is going to be combined into two categories so the communication and social interaction will come together um, and then the second category will be repetitive behaviours but if, essentially these three areas are, uh, will remain at the heart of, of diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And I think the thing that's really important to bear in mind um, in this particular talk is that um, autism, by its nature, is a, is a, is a very varied, um, has a very varied presentation. It's a spectrum disorder, so we see lots of different presentations in terms of severity of characteristics and also the way in which these symptoms sort of manifest themselves. So why might it be important to understand autism spectrum disorder characteristics within genetic syndromes? Well, firstly, it's important in helping us to understand some of the behavioural and difficulties and challenges that people face. Um, understanding these characteristics within this population can help us to ensure that the um, interventions, education strategies, behaviour management strategies that people are receiving are appropriate and effective. And it also um, might help us to um, enable families to access particular resources that are going to be useful to them, particularly um, within the area of, uh, of autism-specific resources. Um, and, and, of course, if we have a better understanding of these characteristics, then we're better able to predict what might happen to, to individuals in the future um, and, and ensure that we can um, input services and um, interventions early. Um, so this shows the uh, prevalence or proportion of people um, across a range of different syndrome groups who score above cutoff for autism spectrum disorder, that's in the grey, the, the lighter grey lines, um, and a more stringent cutoff of autism in the dark grey lines on a screening tool, the social communication questionnaire. So we can see you've got autism spectrum disorder group at this end. So this is a group of individuals with uh, what we might call idiopathic autism spectrum disorder, so without a known um, genetic cause. Um, and then um, a range of different a range of different syndrome groups. And I think what you can take from this um, is that we can see that there is a range of association between particular disorders, uh, syndromes, and the strength of association with um, autism spectrum disorder. So at this end, we have groups like Fragile X syndrome, um, very, very well known to have high levels of association with autism spectrum disorder characteristics, and also Cornelia de Lange syndrome. 
Um, and <coughs> at this end, we have groups like Creed de Chat syndrome and Down syndrome, which have a, a less, um, where, where the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder characteristics is much, much less. One of the things to note here is that um, although there's this variability in terms of strength of association, in all of these groups, the prevalence of these characteristics is much higher than we would expect it to be in the general population. So in the general population, it's about 1% of, of individuals who show or have a diagnosis of autism spectrum disorder. And even here in the groups which show the lowest level of, of prevalence in Down syndrome, for example, it's still around 6%. So it's still higher than we would expect um, to see. Um, and it tells us that individuals with genetic syndromes are at higher risk for showing um, social impairments and autism spectrum disorder characteristics. And one of the things to bear in mind, and one of the things that might explain that high risk, is the fact that um, all of these syndrome groups are associated with some level of intellectual disability. Um, and it's particularly difficult, um, particularly around the, it, for individuals with a severe and profound level of disability, to disentangle um, the overlap um, that we see there between um, characteristics that may be present um, because the individual hasn't yet achieved a level of ability that allows them to show those behaviours, um, and, and or whether the individual generally sh genuinely shows um, autism spectrum disorder characteristics. So it can be very tricky at those levels, and that's something to, to, to keep in mind. Um, and if we look at the presentation of um, these characteristics within these groups, um, we see a lot of variability um, across the group. So what you see here is this is on the same screening measure. Um, this is uh, showing the pattern of scores within each of the domains of the triad of impairment, so in social interaction, communication and repetitive behaviour across the different syndrome groups here. Um, if there's a plus, it means they're showing more, uh, more behaviour than another group, more impairments than another group. A minus is less impaired um, than another group, and the circle's showing that there's no difference between the groups. And what you can see here is it's very varied across the different groups. This pattern, the pattern of pluses and minuses is very, very different. So in Angelman syndrome, um, we see um, greater impairments reported within the area of social interaction and communication, but fewer repetitive behaviours. Whereas in Fragile X syndrome, we see um, impairments in both social interaction and communication, but lots of repetitive behaviour. So um, repetitive behaviour seems to be particularly prominent um, within the trial of impairments in, for this particular group. Um, and notably in Cornelia de Lange syndrome, um, again similarly to, to the Angelman syndrome profile, um, impairments in social interaction and communication, but the repetitive behaviours are not, are not present or, or not, uh, not in the same way as we would expect them to see in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So a very varied profile. And even if we look within particular aspects or particular domains of the triad of impairments, we see this variability. So this, is, this represents the, the pattern of repetitive types of repetitive behaviour that we see in individuals with autism spectrum disorder. So we have stereotype behaviours up here, um, more compulsive like uh, cleaning and tidying, hoarding behaviours here, preferences for routine, uh, restricted preferences, and then repetitive language. And this just shows you the pattern um, of, of repetitive behaviour in this group. And when we compare this to our syndrome groups, I know that this is a big graph. This is really just about getting the different pattern, the different profiles in the groups. Um, we've got the autism uh, spectrum disorder group down here. And if we look across the different syndrome groups, they show a very different pattern and profile of repetitive behaviour. Um, so here are our two groups that score right at the, the top of that first graph, the groups that show the highest level of um, association with autism spectrum disorder, Fragile X and Cornelia de Lange syndrome. You can see the Fragile X um, pattern looks quite similar to the autism spectrum disorder group, um, but perhaps um, looks uh, is it more stereotype behaviours and um, repetitive language and, and fewer of the compulsive-like behaviours. The CDLS pattern does look quite different, um, and there's m far fewer of these sort of repetitive language type um, behaviours. Um, and then if we look again in Angelman syndrome, again, a very different profile. So even within this particular domain of the triad of impairments, um, we're getting very different profiles of behaviour. So prevalence might be high, but there may be subtle uh, differences in terms of the way that the characteristics present themselves. <coughs> 
So I'm going to focus now on Cornelia de Lange syndrome. Um, this is a, a, a rare uh, syndrome, um, around 1 in 40,000 individuals affected. Um, and the gene responsible is on chromosome 5 for around 50% of individuals. Um, and, and there are other cases reported of, of different mechanisms um, in a further 5% of, of individuals. Um, CDLS is associated with mild to profound levels of intellectual disability, a number of physical health um, problems um, and physical um, differences. Um, and um, the literature is very consistent um, in suggesting that around 50 to 60 percent of people <coughs> with Cornelia de Lange syndrome um, score above cutoff for autism spectrum disorder. And this is on a range of different measures, a, a range of different studies um, using both screening tools and observational assessments. So really, um, as, as we saw in the first graph, quite a high rate uh, within this group. When we look at the presentation of characteristics in this group, it's really quite interesting. So what we have here are the mean item scores um, in each domain of the triad of impairments here. Um, we have um, scores on it from individuals with autism spectrum disorder who don't have a genetic syndrome in the white line here. Um, Cornelia de Lange syndrome in the red, and these are individuals who meet or score, meet cutoff for autism spectrum disorder on the on a screening tool. Um, and also individuals um, with Fragile X syndrome, again, who meet cutoff for autism spectrum disorder on a screening tool. So what we would expect to see if Cornelia de Lange syndrome was, was the same uh, or showed the same presentation as, as autism spectrum disorder is so we would expect their scores to mirror this white line, the, the line that we see from the autism group. But in fact, what we see is a very different profile. So although we see very similar levels of impairment in terms of communication and in terms of social interaction, um, are showing very different levels of repetitive behaviour. And this is quite different to what we see in Fragile X syndrome. Here, the Fragile X syndrome group mirror the profile of the autism spectrum disorder group, but just at a lower level. So it might suggest a milder presentation of characteristics, um, but not a different presentation of, of characteristics that we're seeing in Cornelia de Lange syndrome. And if we take this one step further and we start to look at specific individual behaviours that might contribute to those differences, um, again, we see some interesting things. So this shows um, the mean item scores on the ADOS, which is uh, an observational assessment, a diagnostic assessment of autism. And these are the different items here. We've got Cornelia de Lange syndrome of the red blobs, um, the autism, an autism spectrum disorder group are the blue blobs. Um, and what we can see is that on a number of items... The autism spectrum disorder group and the individuals with CDLS are very, very similar, and this is shown by the fact that they, the, the, um, the, the, you know, the red and the blue blobs are almost overlapping with each other, um, and that's that's the case for a number of different behaviours. So showing a lot of similarities, but there are specific differences here. So first of all, in stereotype behaviours, we're seeing less um, uh, stereotyped phrases and odd language in Cornelia de Lange syndrome than we are in autism spectrum disorder. We're seeing less impaired gestures, so gesturing is better in Cornelia de Lange syndrome than it is in individuals with ASD. Less impaired eye contact in this group um, and fewer sensory interests, so fewer sensory repetitive behaviours. And interestingly, um, Finally, what we see is actually increased anxiety in individuals with autism, in individuals with Cornelia de Lange syndrome, compared to the ASD group. So this is the only item here um, where we see the CDLS group showing um, more difficulties, and that's really interesting for us in the context of, of what, when we speak to families and see individuals, um, our impression um, of, of what and what parents are telling us. So what we see described in Cornelia de Lange syndrome uh, anecdotally are very high levels of anxiety associated with social situations, and that's reflected in that ADOS um, item level scoring. Um, we think that the motivation for social contact seems to be intact. People want to engage with other people. They want to make friends, but they really find it very difficult to do so. Um, and they generally, individuals with CDLS, are reported to prefer to observe rather than being involved in, in, a, in, in, in interaction um, and we also see increased levels of withdrawal and isolation, social isolation as demand, social demands become in, increased. 
And this is also evidenced in um, reports of selective mutism in Cornelia de Lange syndrome. So selective mutism being talking in one environment but not another and is thought to be at the very extreme end of social anxiety. In Cornelia de Lange syndrome, um, we can see that it really, the prevalence of selective mutism is extremely high compared to these to, to other, other groups, fragile X syndrome and autism spectrum disorder. Um, and that really seems to be a very prominent difficulty for this group. So what does this tell us about understanding social impairments and ASD characteristics in, the, in genetic syndromes? Firstly, that prevalence rates are high across a number of groups. And there clearly is overlap um, within particular areas of the triad of impairments. And that might mean that some aspects of uh, autism-specific intervention and certainly resources might be useful in this population. But there are also very clear differences um, in the broad profile of behaviours in some groups and some very specific and subtle differences when you look at particular items, particular behaviours um, with, within uh, particular subdomains. Um, and that might tell us that intervention may need to be tailored specifically to um, the individual and to the particular um, syndrome. Um, and something that I haven't really, really been able to touch on, but it might tell us that there are these differences, might tell us that there are different underlying causal pathways. So I'm just going to move on um, to Angelman syndrome, again, another rare syndrome group, uh, caused, this time caused by a, a mutation on chromosome 15. Um, a very severe, usually associated with severe and profound disability, but again, quite high reports of autism spectrum disorder in this group, up to 80% within the literature. And this is really intriguing because actually one of the characteristics of um, Angelman syndrome, a very strong characteristic in this group, is that the children and adults um, are very, very sociable. We see lots of high levels of smiling and laughing and strong motivation for social interaction, and that seems odd. Um, in, very much in contrast to these reports of autism spectrum disorder. So if we look at social communication skills in this particular group, so um, the blue line is individuals with Angelman syndrome, um, red, um, another rare syndrome group, Creda Shah syndrome, and green, Cornelia de Lange syndrome, and we look at their social interaction skills more broadly, so we take that out of the context of an autism-specific assessment and look more broadly at their social responses, we find um, a very different pattern. Um, so individuals with, with, with Angelman syndrome, this is a proportion, uh, a percentage occurrence of social interaction approaches, um, is very, very high in Angelman syndrome, and that's very much in contrast to individuals with Cornelia de Lange syndrome. When we look at their communication skills, this is the frequency of communication, uh, expressive communication, it's very, very low in Angelman syndrome and Cornelia de Lange syndrome. But we see very high levels of positive affect, laughing and smiling, and joint play also um, high levels and, and very similar to individuals with Cree de Chasse syndrome who have... Um, who uh, we know have, have much better social interaction skills. So the question is then, um, what is it about the social interaction responses or interaction skills of individuals with Angelman syndrome um, that, that is leading them to score highly um, within the context of an autism assessment? They're, they're, um, so I'll, I'll, I'll just continue quickly. Um, clearly implications for the way in which we assess um, autism spectrum characteristics um, in genetic syndrome groups. It can be challenging um, and we have to think for, differently about the way in which we evaluate these characteristics. We need a level of detail that, um, that, uh, that allows us to identify specific areas of overlap and difference. Um, and um, I'll, I'll, the slides are not available in your packs, but um, I think they'll be made available from Cerebra. And there's a couple of case studies uh, really just, just demonstrate the importance of understanding these <coughs> characteristics um, and, and recognising that where there is shared, uh, where there is shared overlap. Um, and um, I'll just uh, finish there with some closing thoughts. And there are... Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. Um, I'll, I'll make sure that these are available um, from Cerebra. And uh, there is, if you want more information, um, we uh, produced a brief, an e-briefing for Cerebra, and there are a couple of articles which are available on our website as well, if you want to access those. <laughs>